we're, we're going to be dealing with uh, help for anxiety. Help for anxiety. I want to start out this evening with a quick word of prayer, and then I want to uh, read a question that we had from the first week. It'll be a great uh, reminder of the first two weeks that we covered, and then we'll turn it over to Tim and Elaine to jump into anxiety. Perfect. You guys pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word, your goodness, your kindness to us. Um, the way that you are a God who meets us in the messiness of our lives. Uh, we praise you for that. Um, Thank you. We pray that your word will give us uh, genuine tools for help and for clarity this evening as we talk about such an important topic of anxiety, God. Uh, we are an anxious people as a culture and as individuals. Father, we get in, in much, much of a hurry and uh, the, the pace uh, at times overwhelms us. And there are so many fears that are thrown at us all the time uh, from, from economy to politics to uh, uh, war and even in our own personal lives, God. And so uh, give us your peace, God, that surpasses all of our situations um, and allow us to rest in you this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. This is, I'm going to read a question that we had given to us. Uh, I will respond to it, but it's also a reminder that you have these cards. And please, uh, if you have questions, write those down. You can turn them in at the end of the day. And, uh, and a little bit at the end of our evening time, we may take some hands uh, for conversation if you have a question. But the question that was asked here, in our week one study, we talked about the presuppositions that we're going into with, and, and one of those fundamentally was, uh, was faith, okay? And that is uh, that we're giving answers of faith, answers that come from the Bible, believing that the Bible and the gospel is sufficient to meet those answers. But the question here was, what if you're dealing with someone who doesn't have faith, okay? What do you do then? Uh, and I'm sure a lot of us in our lives interact with people uh, who, who don't have faith and, and don't quite want that answer. Tim's going to add on to the answer that I give real quick. Uh, but the first thing I would say is Romans chapter 1 tells us that God has placed an innate knowledge inside of every person, okay, that he exists. An innate knowledge of God inside of us. And that all of creation speaks to the power and majesty of God. And in Romans chapter 2, he's going to go on to say, every one of us have a conscience that God has given to us. And every one of us knows that we've failed our conscience. Okay? I give that to you just because as I talk with people and as I counsel, I always keep in mind I am calling out a truth that I believe is already in them. Okay? Now, with that said, uh, as you talk to people, um, Romans 1 also goes on to say that uh, we have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So a lot of times, as you're using our skills that we learned from last week, last week was how to be a good listener and how to, uh, how to invest time in people and to gain uh, trust in you, uh, that you've, it, it, right, you don't just jump in with quick fix answers, but rather you learn the situation and, and you listen, you bear burdens. As you do that, people will genuinely uh, like the help of you beginning to expose lies that they have believed in as you unfold. You know what? That's, that's a truth. There's a truth claim that is, is wrong right there, and let me expose that. The reason you're filled with anxiety, the reason that relationship is falling apart is because you're putting too much weight on that. She can't sustain that. He can't sustain that sort of weight, okay? And so you begin to uh, expose those lies, now, as you're exposing those lies, naturally, you will want to point to the answer, right? The answer on the other side, which is Jesus Christ, right? I want to relieve the lie, and then I want to tell you about the hope that's found in Jesus. Now, 
hopefully over time as that uh, as you continue to build a, a trust filled relationship again where we were last week that you will gain more and more of those opportunities okay now tim what would you add to that well uh well i could i would like to preach a sermon on soul care and evangelism <laughs> because i think that is a very important component to what we do with the gospel. So uh, I look at helping people who are struggling as you would uh, someone who's hungry. So if you feed the, the hungry in hopes that you would build a bridge to be able to share the gospel with them, right? And so soul care can function as a, a way of meeting a practical need. If someone does not know how to manage certain parts of their life, you might be able to step in and help them do that without necessarily saying, okay, here's what the Bible says. You may not need to do that in, on the front end of that relationship. But at some point, it seems inevitable that the gospel will come up because uh, secular psychology does this all day long every day where they, they offer help to people without using faith. Uh, and in many cases, they never intend to use faith. But we can offer parts of what we're learning in a very practical way without uh, telling the whole story, if you will. So we have to be, we have to have faith as the counselor or as the, the, the helper that God is at work in that person, as Jason indicated. And so we, we believe that we can only be effective where God is at work. If he's not working, we're probably wasting our time. So when you're dealing with a person who is not a believer, that is a perfect opportunity to love that person with the love of Christ. Uh, as they observe you loving one another, Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by the, the care or the love you have for one another. So there's, there's a beautiful uh, attraction to, to the body of Christ when we are functioning in a very authentic way in our relationships. And that's very hard to resist for a person who's empty and struggling and directionless. So I don't know. That's a, probably a long answer to uh, a, I could have probably done that shorter. So anyway, welcome to this class. And uh, we are going to jump right into the topic of anxiety. And uh, let me just give a disclaimer. I don't think I can do an adequate job covering this topic in just a few minutes. I think we can skim over, we can do an overview, and I think we can get a lot of information and a lot of benefit from what we're going to cover tonight. But just let me um, say that it, there may be partic uh, particular areas of struggle that I'm not going to touch. Uh, we're not going to be talking about panic attacks and, and PTSD tonight, uh, but we're going to talk about the general idea of anxiety because it's important for us to understand what anxiety is from a biblical perspective. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Let me get my slides fixed here. Let's see. Yeah, we need to go start down here. Right there. Okay, uh, statistically, Anxiety disorders are the most commonly diagnosed mental illness in the United States, affecting more than 42 million adults. So it is a huge problem. Now, of course, all uh, anxiety diagnoses are clumped into this, this number, but it still, it still indicates a huge problem. So uh, before we get into the particulars of anxiety, I want to share a couple of passages that lay the groundwork for a biblical view of anxiety. We're going to start in James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, where James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking Nothing. A similar passage comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that, 
the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So let me just point out a few things. Although we are born again, no doubt we are changed, we're regenerated, we still need to mature in our faith. Our faith is not genuine. It's not completely authentic. We have problems. So when you think about faith, faith is not an intellectual experience. Even though we have intellect, we have knowledge, faith is more of an experiential uh, reality in my life because we all live by faith, whether you're a Christian or not. We all live by what we believe. And if I say I believe something and I hope to believe something, yet I get uh, between what we call a rock and a hard place and the pressures of life are mounting, I am going to choose what I really believe. No matter, it doesn't matter what I say in, my, in the Sunday school class. I am going to act upon what I really genuinely believe. And so these passages are intended to help us see that God loves us. And so he allows us to face various trials, resistance, trouble in our life so that our faith can become genuine because we have contaminants or impurities in our hearts that need to be removed or cleansed. Trials or the struggles we face serve as a refiner's fire to heat up these things and bring these contaminants to the surface because you and I don't know what's in our hearts, but God does and he will reveal what needs to be revealed in its time. And then sanctification is the process by which God cleanses, heals, and restores us in Christ. And so this kind of gives us a backdrop as we try to understand anxiety from a biblical perspective. Now, how does the gospel give us hope when we struggle with things like this? And I want want to, first of all, point out that Paul talked a, a whole lot about What we think about. Here are just a few passages where Paul stresses the importance of what we think. In Philippians 4, chapter uh, 4, verse 8, he says, Think on these things, things that are true, noble, just, etc. In Colossians 3, 1, he says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek those things where Christ is and set your mind on those things, things which are above and eternal. And then Romans 12, 2, probably the most popular, where he says, be transformed by the renewing or renovating of your mind. So there's something going on in our minds that we need to pay attention to. Now, at at first glance, anxiety seems to be an emotional problem because it certainly shows up in our emotions. But as we begin to take a closer look, we find that anxiety is actually something that is taking place in our minds. It's, it, it has to do with what we are thinking about and what we are focusing on. So by paying attention to what's going on in our mind, rather than trying to control our emotions, in fact, that's pretty much impossible to do. If you're afraid and I say, hey, look, don't be afraid, that just went out the window. It's like, why did you even say that? I can't just flip a switch and and change my emotional condition. So let's define anxiety. When we look at terms, especially in the counseling world or the soul care world, it's important that we take whatever language we're hearing and we, we find biblical context for it. So OCD, for example, is a fear item. We, we place it in a fear column. Anxiety also falls in the fear column. So the English definition of anxious means to be full of mental distress or uneasiness because of fear of danger or misfortune. We might as well look at its first cousin, worry, which means to torment oneself with something or to suffer from disturbing thoughts. So the Greek word that Paul uses in uh, Philippians 4, Jesus uses it in Matthew 6, uh, this word for anxiety or worry, it it actually means to take thought, means to think about. So when Jesus says, 
take no thought for your life, what you shall wear, what you shall, your body, what you shall put on. Uh, he was saying, he's using this word that expresses a fear or a concern. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, the, the old King James, which some of you may remember, says, be careful for nothing, right? Be careful for nothing. And that's that word, take care or have care about something. And so uh, you, you recall when Jesus said to Mary, uh, I'm sorry, to Martha, said, you are worried and anxious and troubled about many things. Things, but Mary has chosen something different. She's chosen the better way, uh, which she was focused on, on Jesus. And so the idea of this is that we are tempted to care too much about something we should not care so much about. We are actually caring for things that we should not be caring so much about. About And we are expending valuable emotional and mental resources on something that is, going, is not going to benefit us. In fact, it can be counterproductive. So when we mishandle anxiety, it, it affects us in a very negative way. It affects your health. It affects your capacity to make decisions and to think. It can affect your relationships. It can affect your job can affect your life in many, many ways. So uh, we need to understand how we are to manage anxiety. We all experience anxiety. Nobody's exempt from anxiety. And so if we look at the spectrum, it could go from a light uh, version of mild anxiety to something that might feel like a, a full-out heart attack. In fact, many visits to the ER thinking that a person is having a heart attack is actually a panic attack. It's anxiety. So we know that anxiety, though it is emotional, it, it affects, affects us in very tangible ways. So when we look at fear, because anxiety is in the fear co column, fear is a normal God-given reaction to a real or a perceived threat. Uh, when a threat of danger is real, anxiety is my friend. Anxiety helps me survive. So if I'm standing in the middle of a, a road and an 18-wheeler is coming right toward me, anxiety will save my life if I can run fast enough, right? So it, it moves me to action. Anxiety moves us to action. So again, milder versions of anxiety are very normal. If you're taking an exam, you're going for a job interview, you're meeting the in-laws, uh, you know, these are all very natural forms of anxiety. We call these butterflies, nervous energy, a little something's going on, very normal. Nothing sinful about that, nothing abnormal about that. However, some people do experience very high levels of anxiety consistently. Some people live with anxiety all the time. There's never a waking moment when they're not anxious. Now, I don't have time to dive into explain that, but let me just say, if, if there's a scale from zero to 10 and your anxiety level's at a seven when you wake up in the morning and you think that's normal, and I say, hey, are you feeling a little anxious right now? I say, no, I'm good. And you're at a seven. Uh, so you, we, we can become so accustomed to anxiety that we don't even realize we're anxious. Other people might detect it before we do. So when there is a real threat, anxiety is our survival. But sometimes the threat is not real. Sometimes the threat is perceived. And when it is perceived, my brain doesn't know the difference because it's real to me. It might not be real to you, but it's real to me in that moment. And my body and my, my emotions will respond exactly the same way to a perceived threat as it does to a, a, a real threat. So when we think about anxiety from a biblical perspective, we have to be able to see that God may be using our struggle with anxiety for our benefit. In fact, I think a lot of our struggles are things that God is using 
in the context of James, the passage in James and 1 Peter that we read, to reveal to us some areas in our life that we're really not fully trusting God. We're trusting in something or someone else, maybe in ourselves. And so for the individual who is experiencing anxiety, it feels like it is coming upon you. It feels like it is happening to you. Uh, in fact, many people who struggle with anxiety have explained that they are actually afraid they will become anxious. Like they're anxious about becoming anxious. And that's a very real fear. Um, so anxiety is something that cannot be overlooked or minimized. We have to deal with it appropriately. So anxiety does not attack you from the outside. It is an internal reaction to a perceived threat. Um, very often, people from trauma will experience high levels of anxiety. Very common. So if you come from trauma, then you probably are very familiar with anxiety. Uh, whether you have dealt with that well or not, you probably are familiar with it. One of the questions that Jesus asked his disciples, he asked a lot of questions, really good questions. One of them was, why are you afraid? Uh, he asked Peter, why did you doubt? And in all of those cases, they don't answer the question, right? Right. But it's a great question, and we need to ponder that question. Why are you afraid? In fact, questions have been shown to be very beneficial in helping us to stay in our cognitive mind, right? Cognitive uh, thinking. And so when you think about um, anxiety, there's several passages that we could look at. But I'm only going to use two tonight, and I'll, I will do that intentionally. One of the reasons is uh, we tend to think that information is going to help us. And, of course, we need information. But here's the thing. We, we don't normally grow in, in maturity emotionally by reading about it or learning about it. So if, the way I do it is if I want to be more empathetic, I read a book on empathy. That's, that's the way I do it. But it doesn't really help me become more, more empathetic because I'm not doing anything different, I'm just learning about it. And, and, and when you think about uh, information, if you have had knee surgery and you read about the benefits of exercise and movement, that's not going to help you if you don't move, right? Right? Uh, if, if you are wanting to lose weight and you read about diets and how f different foods affect you, uh, that's good information, but that's really not going to help you lose weight if you don't do something different, if you don't do what you are learning, correct? This is exactly the same way. Faith is exactly the same way. So what we tend to do is when we are struggling in a particular category, we just mount the information up. We just read and read and listen to that sermon and, and we just collect all this information. And so I want to try and avoid that. I'm, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we shouldn't be learning. I'm saying that many times we overlook the, the steps we need to take because we, are, we think we don't know enough. And you probably know enough about this for you to do something about it and to, to take action. So when it comes to anxiety, let's look at this one verse. This is 1 John 4, 8. John says, there is no fear, say no fear, in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. The King James says it has torment. It has a tormenting effect. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, this, this verse gives us a clear contrast between fear and love, right? Uh, this is not to condemn us. So if I have fear, if I'm experiencing fear, God is not saying, Tim, you're really failing here because if you really had love in your life, you wouldn't experience fear. That's not, I don't think that's the point of this. I think we, we are able to understand, wow, 
If I am experiencing fear, it, it has something to do with a lack of love. So, so love, in a very simplistic way, is the antidote for fear. So when we are anxious, we generally feel alone. We feel unprotected. We feel vulnerable. We feel like we are in danger. It feels like God's not around. Because we're not confident. We don't really believe that he's with us in that moment. And that is, again, not to condemn us. Here's another thing that's important to understand. Emotions do not usually respond to reason. Think about it. Let's, let's take, for example, a six-year-old boy wakes up in the middle of the night having a horrible nightmare. And he screams at the top of his lungs for mom or dad. And, and so let's say dad comes into the room and and, and dad said, son, what's wrong? He said, something's in my room. Something's in my room. And, and so dad loves his son, right? So he's going to use logic and reason on him. So he's going to turn the light on and said, son, there's nothing in this room. Look, look in the closet. Let's look under the bed. I'll even pull the dresser drawers out. Look, there's nothing. There's nothing in this room. So I want you to go ahead and calm down and, and go back to sleep. And he turns the light out and exits to the room. Well, can you imagine that little boy is not going to calm down? Why? Because he believes. Now, his dad doesn't believe it, but he believes there's something in his room. And his dad's lecture is not going to relieve him of his fear nor calm him down. The best thing that dad can do for his son in that moment is just lie down in the bed with him and say, son, it's going to be fine. Everything's going to be all right. And he'll probably be asleep within minutes because he's not alone. Dad's with him. And if dad's with him, he's safe, right? So this is a picture of how when we are in the, the middle of an intense battle with anxiety, usually your thoughts are not on God because that would be a different scenario if, if they were. So knowing we are not alone when we are afraid is the best remedy for fear. Now, one of the most common phrases in the book of Isaiah is, fear not for I am with you. And I cited Psalm 23 the other day. Uh, I, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because you are with me. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That is the most powerful message contained in the gospel is that God is not distant. He is very present and he is a very present help in our time of trouble. That is true, right? We believe that. And so these passages remind us that God is always present. He's always available. This is a very crucial component in understanding and overcoming a struggle with anxiety. So let's look at some practical help from Scripture. And this is going to be found in Philippians 4, 6. I could have cited other passages uh, or multiple passages, but I intentionally want to stay with this one passage to help us to see how theology needs to be worked out through this process. Or we could say maybe better, it's, it's better to say we, we need to have our theology worked in to this process. So here's what Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We won't have time to get to the second part of that. So the person who struggles with anxiety needs to understand exactly what is happening in that struggle. See, if I'm afraid of something and I'm running away from it, I have no idea what's chasing me. And it's counterintuitive for me to turn around and walk toward what I'm running from. But that's exactly what we need to do. I cannot solve a problem I don't understand. So I have to understand what is 
this struggle in my life. One of the things we say is we need to become a student of our struggle. Doesn't matter what the struggle is. We, un- we need to understand what the struggle is. And because anxiety causes a threat response, we are not usually using our cognitive ability. We're not usually thinking. We are in that survival zone. And so in the middle of the struggle, we're not thinking. We're actually just reacting to the threat that we perceive. So notice how Paul forces us in this passage to engage our prefrontal cortex and our cognitive function. He's going to give us a path toward peace, right, toward freedom. Uh, And it's going to be a lot lot easier to hear it or for me to say it than it is to actually do it. Let me just forewarn you. This is great, solid, true information. But it's like the knee replacement surgery. Until we do it, and sometimes it takes a lot of practice, and we make uh, progress in very small steps sometimes. So he says this, do not be anxious. That's like a command. That's a directive. Don't do that. Like, don't do that. And something in me says, yes, sir. Okay, I'm not going to do that. And then I hear him when he writes, look, be angry, but don't sin in your anger. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And I hear him say in Ephesians 5, love your wife the way Christ loved the church. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. And I realize I can't do any of that (laughs) within myself. I don't have those capabilities. I need him to teach me how to do that. A disciple is a learner who is disciplined. I have to be disciplined enough to learn the lessons he is teaching me. So the first thing Paul says, don't do that. Don't be anxious. Do this. Here's what I I want you to do. I want you to pray. Prayer. This this concept is a a concept of worship. It, it, It implies drawing near to God. Like I am being reminded of who God is, that he is present. And in so doing... I am anchoring my soul in reality. I'm anchoring my soul in the fact that God is with me. I'm remembering that I'm not in this struggle alone. I'm focusing my attention on God being present with me. Now, let me give you a word of caution. A lot of people think that when they, they're voicing their concerns out of desperation that they're actually praying. And I want to suggest that that's not prayer because I can look back on my own life and I knew some other people, oh, Jesus, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. It just like just being out of control, out of desperation, just worked up. That was, that was not calming me down. And so I thought I'm praying, but in fact, I wasn't praying. I was just feeding the anxiety with these religious terms. And so when anxiety begins to rise and increase, I need to learn how to calm myself. And Paul is saying, here, here's the first step. Remind yourself that God is present. Remind, don't forget who God is and don't forget that he is present with you. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God. There's not a thing he cannot do. If I believe he's with me, that's going to make a difference in my life. The problem is, I don't really believe that in that moment. I'm, I'm being, uh, fear is being evoked by my circumstances or by an event that just happened. And so Paul says, pray. So at, at this point, he, we're not asking God for anything at this point. We're just kind of focusing our attention on the fact that God is present. We're directing our hearts to him. We're reminding ourselves that we're not alone. And next, Paul adds, and supplication. And so this is the recognition of my need. I need to ask for something. I need to approach God asking him for something. This is really interesting because the the anxious person 
doesn't usually know what he or she needs in that moment. If you, if you just distracted them and said, hey, let me ask you, what do you need right now? Here's probably what you're at heel. Here. I don't know. I just need this to go away. I want this. I want to be done with this. I don't want to experience this. I don't want to feel this. Well, that, again, is desperation. That's escape thinking. That's, I, I, just, I just want to get a, I want it to go away. That's not a battle m- mindset. That's not let me engage this thing that I'm afraid of and find out what it is and realize I have a choice in, in this. I am not uh, helpless in this situation. So Paul says, supplication. Find out. Ask, ask God for what you Need. So Paul forces the struggler to think about what he or she needs. What do I need? What am I fearing right now? What do I feel threatened by? Uh, the power of fear is in the unknown. So as long as I am ignorant of my struggle and what I'm facing, fear will dominate me. But if I understand it, I take the power is removed. Because not to mention, in and of itself, that threat is not, doesn't have the power to, to destroy me. But God is with me, and he won't allow that to happen unless it's my time to go. So Paul writes to Titus in chapter 2, and, and I find this so intriguing. And, and he's talking about Titus, teach the older men to be sober, graves, six or seven things. Teach the older women to be you know, respect their husbands. Don't give to give yourself to wine, et cetera, et cetera. Five or six things, and then t- that they teach the younger women to you know be keepers at home, et cetera. Another five or six things, and then he gets to the young men, and he says, "Teach the young men," and he only lists one item: teach the young men to be sober-minded. Sober-minded. I wish I had time to talk about that because it is very important when it comes to. The, the discussion on anxiety. But if you think about somebody who's sober, what is the opposite of being sober? Now, I know you're Baptist. You don't might not even know the answer to that question. But there's some people who get, they get intoxicated. <laughs> and so when you are intoxicated, you are basically, if you get really intoxicated, you're out of control. You don't have control of all your faculties. But a sober per- person does. And so Paul is implying, number one, that young men, if there's a, a struggle that young men deal with more than anything else, I would think this is important. And in my experience, when I meet with young men, uh, at one time I, I did a survey, 70% of the young men I was meeting with struggle with anxiety. And so it, it kind of makes sense why Paul would say that. But Paul is saying Don't allow your mind to run out of control. Teach these young men how to live with a sober mind, a self-discipline, a disciplined mind. So when these attacks come, their minds are not chasing rabbits and running scared, that they are able to focus and have soundness in their thinking. So... I've given you an action step in your notes, and if you struggle with anxiety, this is just one action step. Uh, I recommend making a list of what you need and you feel that you don't have, especially in the middle of a, a battle with anxiety. Think about that. What is it that you think you are uh, not that you do not have? And so the next thing in Paul's path, yes. Well, let's say that uh, I feel like I just want relief. I, I, want, I want this feeling to go away. I, I don't like being scared. Like what I need is for God to take this away. So I would ask him for that. I would say, Lord, I need you to take this away. And so when we get to the Thanksgiving piece uh, and you begin to assess your, your blessings, you might find that you already have what you need. But because we don't ask the question, then we don't always know that we, wait, you already have that. That's kind of like when I can't find my stuff at home. You know, I say, Lane, it's not in the closet. My shoes are not in there. 
I already looked. Just the other day, I was making PJ, P and J sandwiches, and uh, I ran out of jelly. I said, we, I think we're out of jelly. I used the last. She said, there's another jar in there. I said, no, I looked. <laughs> sure enough, there's another jar in there. And so, uh, you know, people make mistakes. So a, there, a lot of times we, we think we, we need something and we don't have it when all of, we, we actually do have it. We just haven't really paid attention to what we do have. So Paul adds now that this third phase of this is do this with a posture of thanksgiving. And so here's what happens. In every case, Paul is moving the reader toward Staying mentally engaged. He wants the reader engaged in this process. So pray. Remember God is with you. Uh, supplicate. Ask God for the things you need. And then be thankful for what you have. Because see, anxiety focuses on what you don't have or on what you might lose. So your job, your health, your, your life. Uh, so Paul is saying, be sure to be thankful what, for what you do. So assess your life and, and begin to think about what can I be thank, what am I thankful for? Well, I'm thankful that I have a functioning body that is going berserk right now. I'm thankful that I am alive. I'm thankful that I have uh, uh, you know, family members. I'm thankful that I can walk and I can see. I mean, you can go on staying engaged in the process to remind yourself Hey, I'm doing pretty good, actually, except for this fear, this anxiety that I'm dealing with right now. So blessings, as we assess them, blessings remind us of God's faithfulness. And it reminds us that we have hope, that God is present, and there are things he is very, very uh, capable of meeting every need that we have. So an action step would be to make a list of the things you're thankful for. Now, you may already have a list, and if you've struggled with anxiety, you might have a kind of a standing list that you, you refer to. But it's very important that you engage your thinking in this direction. And then he says, uh, as he pushes us toward proactive and intentional steps, let your request be made known to God, like let your request be very specific. Uh, and so, when you think about it, I think what I need is peace right now. I, I need I need to be calm. Well, who's the Prince of Peace? Now, granted, I understand that we have to be very gentle with a person who is struggling with anxiety. We're not just preaching to them, here's what you need to do. We, we want to be very supportive, very compassionate, because this, like the little six-year-old, even though dad didn't believe that there was something in the room, he did, and for him, it was life-threatening. And so we have to be uh, considerate of the struggle our brother or sister may be going through. And so, uh, but some of the questions that I need to ask myself in this request phase is, uh, what do I actually need? Am I aware of my tendencies? Am I aware of the things that tend to evoke fear in me? Uh, you may call these triggers, uh, but there might be certain uh, things. Watching the news might trigger your anxiety. Hearing a, a, a bad health report of a family member might trigger your anxiety. Your anxiety. Uh, and I'm correcting myself when I say your anxiety because it's really not yours. That, that belongs to somebody else. But you're experiencing it. And you need to be able to, to learn what is it that I'm more susceptible to that may, my brother or my friend might not be susceptible to that. But I am. And I can tell you, uh, I don't like horror movies. I just don't like them. I never did. I, when I was a kid, I watched The Wizard of Oz. And I'm like, I saw green ladies, witches, for, for a long time. And I'm like, mm-mm, not doing that. So I'm free to watch them. Nothing wrong with it. But I'll tell you, 
it messes with me, and I don't, I don't go there. I don't, that's un, an unnecessary expense for me. But the, the, the request needs to also be, Lord, help me to see what I don't see. What, am, what lie, to Jason's point, what lie am I believing right now? What am I believing that's really not true? And then what is the worst thing that could possibly happen? See, that's the threat of fear. Oh, no, this might happen or, if, or, that, or that might happen. And then, but what would happen if you call fear's bluff and you say, well, so what if that does happen? Where's God going to be if that happens? Well, he's not going to abandon me. He's going to be present if the worst possible thing happens. And this is a way of confronting your fear and facing off with it. It's a giant that you need to face off with. And so is my, de- is my desperation legitimate? I feel desperate. Is that legitimate? Is, do I have a reason to feel that? These are all very self-evaluating think, uh, thoughts that could help us to, to find out, okay, what is it that I need to personally ask God for in this moment? So the action step for that phase is to make a list of the lies you usually believe when you're anxious. And this is something that can be very powerful because if you've never thought about it, then when you hear yourself, and what I recommend is just writing these things down. Like when you're in the middle of a battle with anxiety, write down what you're actually believing. Now be honest. Don't, don't think, oh, I'm, I'm not supposed to say that because I know the Bible says something different. No, write what you really believe because this is an opportunity for you to learn and to find out what's in your heart. God already knows what's in your heart. And this, this trial is designed to bring those contaminants up. These lies begin to emerge in the heat of that battle. If you don't pay attention to them, you might not be able to identify them. So this is important that you list those things. And so let's say you take this list tonight and go home, and let's say tomorrow night you have a panic attack or some battle with anxiety, and you don't do any of this. It's like, oh, I just went to that class. So look, that's okay. Reflect. Reflect. You know, watch the game film. Like, go back and say, well, what, what, was, what was happening? What, what did I do? What was I responding to? What, what was a possible lie I was believing? And write that down. And so you're beginning to understand your situation better, which uh, what I'm trying to say is the struggle can become your classroom. This goes with, with all your struggles. You need to become a student of your struggle. And the classroom is where you're going to learn several things. Number one, you're going to learn about yourself, the lies I'm loyal to. And so when it comes to addictions or strong life-dominating habits, uh, usually the reason we can't break free from them just by choosing it is because there are deep loyalties within our heart connected to those things. So if we don't understand that connection, we're just hoping that things will change. So this is is where the classroom becomes very important. So what are my mental and emotional habits? Very good question because, see, a habit by definition is unconscious behavior. So I am thinking things. I'm choosing it, but I am not aware that I'm choosing. So there are habits that are engaged when I am tempted to fear that I need to become aware of. So the unconscious has to, again, become conscious so I can address it. I learn about myself in the classroom. I also learn about God and his word. I learn that he's present with me, that he's for me, he's not against me, that he sympathizes with me in my struggles, and that he empowers me to choose the truth. He is for me. I learned that in this classroom. I also learned that I have not been believing the truth about God. And that's just a repentance issue. And so the, the external repentance seems to be a, a lot easier, even though some of it's very difficult, a lot easier than this, this mental repentance where I have to turn my back on a lie and choose the truth 
It's very powerful. And then I learned to direct my heart and my thoughts in a life-giving direction. And so through this process, God is cleansing us of uh, the contaminants, this darkness that is still connected to our old ways of surviving without Christ before we met Christ. And he refines and purifies our faith in that process. And my trust in him, my dependence upon him becomes more and more authentic as I repeat these lessons in the classroom of life. And so here's the thing. If you look at your struggle as a classroom, then it's not a pass or fail. It's not like, oh, I keep failing. Well, if you're learning more about what you're struggling with and what you're battling and why, what, are the, what the components of that battle are, if you're learning that, you're not failing. You're, yeah, you're not completely free and victorious, sure, but we don't need that today. You might want that today and your spouse might want that today. But as far as progressive sanctification, the more we understand the battle, the more we are able to say, oh, I see what I did. I gave in to that, that lie. I felt alone. I believed I was alone. And I, I wasn't mindful of the presence of God in my life. Uh, the process, you, you, you might remember the scene where Jesus, this is Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, we're going to go across to the other side. They get in the boat. Jesus falls asleep. Uh, a storm arose, water's pouring into the boat. They, they wake him and they, they ask this question. Do you not care that we are perishing? Seems like a simple question, but it's actually packed with accusation. Right? Number one. We're dying, <laughs> you don't care. We're dying and you don't care. That is the narrative of anxiety. I'm, I'm dying, I'm suffocating, and God, where are you? So Jesus speaks to the storm, peace, be still, and he asks two questions. Why are you afraid and why did you doubt? Do you think they answered those questions? Of course not. Why are you afraid? Why did you doubt? And they turn to one another and they, they say, who, who is this that the waves and the wind obey him? Now, of course, they knew who he was. This is Jesus. They've been following him for months. I mean, some of them were distant relatives of his. I mean, they knew this was Jesus. But here's what they didn't know. They, they had never seen Jesus in that environment. They had never seen him do what he did in that set of circumstances. And so they learned something about Jesus in one of the most horrific experiences of their life. So when I'm dealing with a struggle of anxiety or you or depression, we'll talk about that later. God is wanting to reveal himself in ways he has never revealed himself to you. You know him, but you don't know him like that yet. And the classroom gives you the opportunity to get to know him. When you're working with someone or even when you're struggling yourself, I'd like for you to think about, let's think, think of a child who's afraid of the water. Like they don't even want to get close to it. And so you want to encourage this child. And, and so you, uh, you jump in the water, you throw the ball around, splash, having so much fun. Don't you want to get in? Mm -mm. And so you try to coerce him. The, the process of that child getting in that water may start with just getting his toes wet. And you should not force him. This is a slow process. But later he might stick his, his, his legs in, might sit in it one day. Uh, but that is going to be a process because he's afraid of something. You don't see the point. You don't even see why he would be afraid of that. That's not important. He's afraid of it. And until he gains experience and he sees that, wait, this is not as threatening as I thought, then he begins to accept it as normal. Here's a few uh, summary statements as we come to a close. 
Anxiety is not an outward problem. Circumstances do not create or cause anxiety. Anxiety is not something that happens to me. It is my reaction to life's circumstances. And then I've just put some action steps on there as a summary um, for you if that might be helpful in real time. So, Tim, yes. while I've got you right here, you, you did an incredible job. My goodness. Uh, yeah, you guys give him a hand. Mm. Uh, I, I hate to critique at all, but one of the things you said here was uh, you, after this last ac action step, you, you, you specifically talked about God's word in answering that. Would, wouldn't we just add that to a next action step? So once you've listed the lies that you tend to believe, uh, then go and find scripture yep. specifically Great. about it. Yes. Start memorizing some of those scriptures. Yes. You know, take that to heart because that, that trial is coming back around. Yes. All right. You've done good to recognize the lies you're believing, but, but a lot of us don't know our Bible that well. But the Bi does the Bible speak to anxiety? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, well, and another point to that, Jason, is uh, music can be more comforting and helping to calm you, you know, deep breaths, some practical things of taking walks. But uh, again, that's a bigger subject to, to cover, but yes, definitely. Yeah, I, I just didn't, didn't want to end with, without saying, hey, add a fourth action step, and that is just find scripture that you're gonna memorize, that you're gonna put into action to answering those specific lies. Yes, Paul. Uh, yes, I do. I do think there's a spiritual warfare component. Yeah, if, you, if you couldn't hear, the question was, is there a spiritual warfare component to that? Um, absolutely. Uh, your enemy is the father of lies. So the most prominent way that your enemy attacks you is through lying to you, which is, yeah. which is what uh, we've continued to uncover here. And um, you had said this, uh, the first two weeks, um, and I thought you displayed it magnificently here, uh, but let's tie this together. Uh, the first week, uh, uh, you were leaning into where we're going and some of the mental health issues we had, and you made the statement, you may have prayed about it, but it didn't go away sort of deal, and this... It stuck in my mind because I, I like the way you were using it because of what we're talking about here tonight. So let's unpack that just a little bit. I know you certainly in counseling sessions and myself included in terms we, we have all prayed that the anxiety would just go away, right? Just like Paul did in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, Lord, you got to take this yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we've prayed, God, could it all just go away? But most often, he doesn't make it just go away. And rather, what we've unfolded here is because your faith is more precious than gold, that God wants to draw out those lies and answer them. So the type of prayer that is offered here in Philippians uh, 4 is different than the type of prayer of, God, please just make it all go away. Because we've all prayed the, God, please just make it go away prayer mm -hmm. uh, and found it pretty ineffective. Okay? Um, but here, what you've unfolded and what I think is, is so brilliant and important, guys, God loves you too much to give you the, uh, the, the quick fix. Because the reality is, 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 remember Tim said, you don't know what you really believe until you're squeezed. Mm -hmm. And in those moments that you're squeezed, what you actually believe is coming out, okay? And, and God in his kindness is showing us what we believe 
And now we have to do that spiritual battle, Paul. You, you've got to take those thoughts captive. You've got to mm -hmm. examine your heart. You've got, yes. it's actually a work of the Holy Spirit. One of the things I like to pray with everyone I counsel with, as soon as we meet first session, we, because oftentimes I'll ask the question, hey, what are you so afraid of? What are these triggers? And, what, and, and you know what answer I get more than anything? Mm. I don't know. Yep. And I say, you know what? That's a work of the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of God that resides in you, we're going to start praying that the Spirit of God will show you exactly what you are afraid of, what these triggers are. And we just begin by praying that, that God would show us. And then as those things come up, just like you said, then we start dealing with them. Then we start saying, all right, what does the word of God say about that? What scriptures can we memorize? And how can we start to put this into practice? Let, let me say, you're, you're pointing to something that uh, in, in generic counseling, we, we uh, adopt a self-help approach. We say, what do I need to do to help my situation? Uh, not that that's wrong, but you're pointing out the deeper uh, spiritual component, that is, how does God want to teach me to battle this? So it's not that I'm on my own, I have to figure it out. He's actually leading me. I always think, think of uh, helping kids find Easter eggs. You know, you, it's like they, they, don't have, they don't have a clue where those eggs are. And you're just like, oh, try over here, look over here. That's kind of how the Lord leads us, you know? It's like, what about that? Maybe look under that rock. And, and he, he reveals these things that he knows we need to know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think that's so profound. And I think it's so helpful for each of us to remember Right, The prayer of Ephesians 4 is completely different from the prayer of, God, can you just make this go away? The other thing uh, is if you're trying to build a muscle, you mentioned this in a sermon recently, then you need resistance. And, and so God wants to strengthen us through our trials. And if we say, Lord, you've got to take this weight away. And he's like, well, if I take the weight away, you don't get stronger. Yeah, yeah. So, and the other thing is uh, when, when humans are immature, we see this in our children, we say, I can't. He say, well, why don't you go, go clean your, I can't. Uh, it's, not they can't. it's not that they can't. It's not that they can't. It's that they don't want to or it's too hard. And, and a lot of times that's how we approach these struggles. It's like, it's, I'm overwhelmed. I can't, Lord. You have to do it. And the Lord said, no, oh, you can actually do it. I'm going to help you, but. You can, you can do this. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's brilliant. That's so good. Yeah, Mike? When, when I do inventories with people in another fellowship that I'm a member of, one of the things when they get down to their fourth step and have to look at themselves very, very closely, one of the first things I tell them is where your resistance is, identify where your resistance is. Allow yourself to move into where that resistance is, where you can see it more clearly. And it does happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great point. Well, my goodness, this, this has been phenomenal. And uh, let, me, let me just say uh, how the Lord has gifted you to eloquently and so delicately uh, and wisely handle God's word and, and to teach us all along, reminding us to, to, to treat not only ourselves, but others that we deal with with, with patience and, and care. Uh, and so I was... Amen. Extremely blessed this evening uh, to, uh, to have you teach us. Let me pray for Thank us you. and we're done. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you. Uh, we love your word. We are so thankful for your son and his nearness to us. Uh, and, and Father, we have a lot to work on, and we praise you for that, that you are a God who disciplines his children and who cares so deeply about our faith that you are willing uh, to exercise those faith muscles and, and to grow us and to teach us uh, through your servant, Tim, in an incredible way how to use and how to apply your word. Father, may we, may we be those who this evening 
uh, go home and tomorrow and begin to put into practice. May yes. we grab a, a journal and begin to list out the things that we are anxious about and, and pray that your spirit would teach us and guide us and show us with clarity to be able to put our finger on our issues of anxiety, what the real issue is. Oftentimes we get so distracted by the, by the symptoms and the emotions of it, but to put our finger on the deeper issues that you are dealing with Thank and then you, to Jesus. answer them from your word, God. We want to put into practice. God, we thank you so much for this evening. Uh, we want to walk with you closer. We trust you that you're going to strengthen our faith uh, and that you will, uh, you are the one who began this work in us and you will yes, complete Lord. it until the day of Christ Jesus. We believe that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Again, questions on those cards. You can leave those on the table. We will pick them up and I hope to see you next week. Next hey, week we're on. You didn't tell them about that book. Oh, real quick on your way out the door. I am holding a small book that I would highly recommend. You can get it off Amazon for like 10 bucks. It is called Triumphing Over Sinful Fear by John Flavel. You can come up and take a picture of it. It is amazing at helping you work through fear. And he just explains it in an awesome, awesome way. So I highly recommend this book. You come up with your phone, take a picture. It, I promise you it'll be worth the 10 bucks off Amazon. Job.